Today we are looking at a case from the 19th century. So sit back as we go to France. Victor Joseph Prévost was born on the 11th of December 1836 in the small town of Mormont, which is situated about 40 miles southeast of Paris. His father worked as a coachman, taking passengers from town to town, while his mother stayed at home to look after young Victor and his two elder brothers, named Leon and Eldolf. He suffered from bulimia from a very early age, something that had also affected his father. He was a happy child and enjoyed playing with his brothers and going to school. Since the early years of the 19th century, France had experienced a steady increase in schools that offered universal compulsory elementary education. The highest growth rate was between 1821 and 1837, when these schools were not only opened in large towns and cities, they also reached the more rural areas of the country. Victor and his brothers attended one of these schools. When Victor was 14 years old, he left Mormont and went to Paris, where he took up a position in a business that made fences and trellises. Trellises were very popular in France. The French people were very keen to make sure that their gardens and outside spaces looked as good as possible. Inspiration had long since been taken from the beautiful gardens at the Palace of Versailles, which were designed by André Le Nôtre and were considered by Louis XIV to be just as important as the splendour in the palace itself. Victor, however, was unhappy with his position. He was made to work long hours, and while the other employees were given a bed to sleep on, he had to make do with a mattress on the floor. The fact he suffered from bulimia also did not endure him to the rest of the workers. In 1850, bulimia was not a condition that was understood by the medical profession, and Victor's employers thought him to be a greedy and selfish young man. When he was caught stealing a piece of bread, they whipped him and reduced his food rations. Life had become very different to the peaceful upbringing he enjoyed with his family in Mormon. He grew up to be a very strong young man. He was also helpful and considerate to others, but being treated in the manner he was by his bosses was something he had never experienced before. Things changed for him when he saw a young man who was delivering meat get knocked over by a milk cart. The driver of the milk cart did not stop and just continued on his way. Victor, however, assisted the young man and carried the meat to the address where it needed to be delivered, which was a nearby butcher's shop. The butcher was very grateful for Victor's assistance and offered him an apprenticeship. So young Victor Joseph Prevu left his position at the fence and trellis manufacturer and started his training to become a butcher. Victor very much enjoyed his work. He would have to carry meat over long distances, visiting pie makers, restaurants, hotels and private customers. He also learnt about the different cuts of meats and eventually mastered his trade. When the day ended, he was also permitted to eat as much food as he desired. He was a handsome young man and female attention seemed to follow him. However, when the mistress of the owner of the butcher's shop started paying him too much attention, he was dismissed. Not to be downhearted about the predicament he now found himself in, Victor started to work in a school where again he attracted much female attention. In April 1855, he was conscripted into the army. The French army had been conscripting soldiers for many years, notably during the French Revolution, when the newly created republic needed stronger military forces. All young boys grew up well aware of the saying, any Frenchman is a soldier and owes himself to the defence of the nation. Victor served in the army until the end of 1861, but in the autumn of 1862, he re-enlisted and spent the next seven years in military service. In 1866, he was assigned to the very prestigious squadron of the Songrad, who had the responsibility of escorting the Emperor Napoleon III on horseback to his public appearances. They also looked after his family and guarded the imperial palaces. In 1867, at the ball of La Trillerie, a lady who was accompanying an embassy attaché was spotted asking many questions and taking notes. She was asked to leave the ball and interrogated by the police. The lady was very attractive and the police seemed to be very suspicious as to why she had been taking notes. Their investigation uncovered 
that this lady was from a wealthy family who spent her time traveling, going to balls and having rendezvous with handsome young men, one of whom was a very well-regarded member of the squadron of the Songard named Victor Joseph Prevo. Not long after the ball, the lady was no longer seen around Paris. The police investigated her disappearance and discovered that the last time anyone could remember seeing her was the same night she had been seen in the company of Victor. However, they made little effort to investigate. She was known to travel and they thought that she had probably just decided to leave Paris for a while. They did speak to Victor, but he told them that he did not know where she had gone. And as he was a well-regarded member of the military, the police had no reason to suspect that he had done anything untoward. In 1869, Victor ended his distinguished service in the military and began working as a policeman. His main responsibility was to be a presence on the streets and make sure that all the good citizens of Paris were going about their business in an orderly fashion. He soon became a familiar figure in the areas that he patrolled. He was always friendly to children who usually respected him as a figure of authority. Ladies were always very eager to catch his eye or make an excuse to talk to him. As he passed, they would often whisper to each other and he soon became more commonly known as the handsome man. Victor, however, struggled at his position. He was a strong and imposing character. So although he found it easy to control anyone who was causing a commotion, he himself did not always conduct himself in an exemplary manner. This was strange as when he finished his military career, he had left with an impeccable record and a certificate of good conduct. Although Victor was not married, there was a lady who he had spent much time with. Her name was Adele Blondon. She had worked for many years for an elderly gentleman who had bequeathed her 30,000 francs in his will. Adele was a very careful lady. She had invested some of the money she was left into a small business. She would usually hide her jewellery and money around her house. The 27th of February 1876 was a Sunday and Adele left her home at around midday to go and have lunch with Victor. He was living in a small apartment at 22 Rue de l'Evangile, which was opposite the police station where he was based. It was a cold day and Adele's landlady saw her leave. She paid her particular attention as she noticed that Adele had put on much more jewellery than usual and as well as wearing a very elegant dress and coats, she had placed a brightly coloured tartan shawl over her shoulders. Adele, however, did not return. She had a sister to whom she would sometimes lend money. Having not heard from Adele for a while, she went to her house, but Adele was not there. She asked the landlady, but she had not seen her. The landlady took her spare key and along with Adele's sister, entered the house. It was immaculately tidy. Nothing was out of place, but there was no sign of Adele. The two women then went to the police station and informed them that Adele Blondon was missing. They told the officer that on the day Miss Blondon was last seen, she was on her way to visit Victor Prevo. Victor was asked if he knew where she may be, but he said he did not. The police did not spend too much time investigating the case. People would often disappear for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they would turn up again, and other times they would not. But by 1876, the population of Paris had grown to nearly 2 million people. And although it was a city where some of the wealthiest families in France lived, it was also home to many of the poorest. Petty crime was increasing, and looking for a lady who may have left Paris under her own volition was not high on their list of priorities. Over the next few years, Victor continued to work and Paris continued to grow. In 1878, the finishing touches were put on an elaborate palace that was constructed on the northern bank of the River Seine, named Place du Trocadero. This was to be home of the Third World Fair that was being held between the 1st of May and the 10th of November. On the 30th of June 1878, the completed head of the Statue of Liberty was showcased in the Trocadero Palace Garden. In the early evening of the 10th of September 1879, a lady named Madame Thierry saw a tall gentleman suspiciously standing on a corner. He was tall and dressed in a long gown type coat and was wearing a cap. This area was always quite deserted at nights, so she was surprised to see anyone about. 
usually only people who are up to something no good, would be in this particular part of Paris after dark. There was a small stream, and he seemed to be putting something in it. She observed from a distance, and when she saw the gentleman hastily depart, she went to find out what he had left. It was a packet of freshly cut meat. Why would he leave it there, she wondered. Meat was expensive. As she picked it up, she was spotted by a policeman. He asked her exactly what she was doing, and Madame Thierry explained what had happened. The policeman listened, and then asked her to accompany him to the station. There was something strange about the meats, and when the police asked a medical doctor to look at it, he informed them that the meat was from a human arm. The police chief instructed his officers to be on alert, and a search was undertaken to see if they could find any other suspicious packages. After two days of searching, 77 additional packages were discovered. They were all taken to the mortuary, where the pathologist did his best to piece her body back together. However, identification was impossible, as the head had not been found. The police interviewed Madame Thierry. She told them that although she was not acquainted with the man who she had seen, he resembled the police peacekeeper, who was known locally as the handsome man. She also told the inspector that she believed that in 1877, the man she had seen had lived very close to her in Rue de Rosses. The inspector took down her statement and passed it to Commissioner Leferber. Both men agreed that the suspect may have resembled Victor Brevo, but he was a person who had an impeccable army record and who had worked for many years keeping the peace in Paris. He was a very unlikely suspect. Nevertheless, they brought him in for questioning. When he was questioned by the commissioner, Victor was nervous and uneasy. His answers were vague, and he seemed unsure of exactly what to say. At first, he said he did not know the area where Madame Thierry had allegedly seen him. The commissioner, however, reminded him that it was a part of Paris where he had worked many times in the past. When asked of his whereabouts the previous evening, he said that he had been in his apartment. However, when the police interviewed his neighbours, they said that they had seen him out carrying a bucket covered with a cloth. When Victor was asked to explain what he was doing with a bucket and a cloth, he looked downwards. He said nothing for a few moments before raising his head and looking straight at the commissioner. He said that he had the bucket and cloth on his person as he was the one who Madame Thierry had spotted leaving the package by the stream. The commissioner was somewhat shocked by his confession and instructed that a search be undertaken in Victor's apartment. Just a few minutes after arriving, the police found the missing head. The victim was later identified to be a local jeweller named Monsieur Lenoble. He was reported missing the previous evening by his wife. He was 38 years old and had two children, aged 11 and 6. Victor told the commissioner that the gentleman had come to his apartment at his request with the intention of selling him a gold chain, which he would pay by instalments. And as the jeweller wrote down the terms of the sale, Victor struck him with a piece of iron. He then put him in a trunk and started to dismember his body. That evening, he began disposing of the body parts in areas known to him around Paris. The search of Victor's apartment had uncovered other items of interest, including jewellery and a distinctive tartan shawl. When questioned about this, Victor denied any involvement in the disappearance of Adèle Blondin. However, the police continued to investigate. Small bloodstains were discovered at his previous apartment on Rue de l'Evangile, and Miss Blondin's sister and landlady identified the tartan shawl as having belonged to her. As the commissioner presented this to Victor, he confessed to the murder. He later said that after he killed her, he dismembered her body and put pieces in different parts of Paris. He agreed to show the commissioner where her head was buried, and when they arrived to the location, Victor pointed to the exact spot. After a few minutes of digging, the skull of Adèle Blondin was pulled from the earth. The commissioner questioned Victor about two unsolved crimes. The first was of a fellow peacekeeper who had disappeared without trace a few years earlier, and the other was of a beautiful lady who was from a wealthy family who spent her time travelling, going to balls and having rendezvous with handsome young men who had mysteriously disappeared 
12 years earlier in 1867, the commissioner reminded him that he was the last person to have seen the lady alive. Victor, however, said that he had nothing to do with those unfortunate events. He made a statement confessing that he was responsible for the murders of Madame Adèle Blondin and Monsieur Lenoble. In this statement, he wrote of how he very much regretted his actions. The trial of Victor Prevot began in Paris on the 7th of December 1879. During the trial, he showed little emotion. He was calm and answered any questions from the judge when asked. Statements were read and witnesses were called, but the outcome was never in any doubt. When the jury went out to consider their verdict, they returned 20 minutes later to find the defendant guilty and Victor Prevot was sentenced to death. He was taken to the La Roquette Grand Prison and his lawyers appealed his sentence. While this was being considered, he often spoke to the prison priest. He attended mass and received his first communion, something he had not done as a child. He also wrote to his brother Adolphe. In this letter, he said how sorry he was for what he had done and asked for his forgiveness. His appeal was unsuccessful, as was his plea for a pardon and at seven o'clock on the 19th of January, 1880, Victor Joseph Brevo was guillotined in front of a large crowd who, despite a very cold Paris morning, had come to see his execution. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, I would really appreciate any comments or feedback that you may have, and I hope to see you all again on the next brief case.